Excellent. We are we're now live on YouTube as well. Um, and um, my colleagues will share the link as well. Um, Shayla, you have now also the um, a copy of the PDF for the storyline. Just that as well. So we're good. And um, Marcel, just just again one last point for information. We we have made a storyline with uh, the questions that we want to ask. Mm -hmm. And That's some of okay. it is yeah. So we're going to be using a projection, but it's it's all controlled uh, from our end. Again, you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And the, we try to have a certain order, but um, you know it it could appear random as well, which is okay. And we might jump things. And we, we try we try to keep it as flexible as possible. Okay, very good. Okay. So we are uh, five minutes past the hour and in approximately 30 seconds, I will bring in everybody else on the, in the lobby and then I'll hand over to the director. For this start. I just wanna make sure that my video is visible. And um, stop share temporarily. Then I can Excellent. So Good, we're good now. Uh, Sheila, can you just confirm my screen is visible? It's, it's okay, yeah. I see it, no problem. Oh, Maraba, Brisho, Bengi, Bengi, Nina Maona. 
Safi sana. Hello, Marcel. Maxine here. Oh, dear Maxine from Hello. Australia. So you have you have an evening entertainment here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I mightn't last the whole whole journey, but I'll try. <laughs> mm, yes, very nice to see you. So Africa to the US to Australia. It's wonderful. It is. Hello, Marcel. Oh, Greetings. Bart. Greetings from the Maldives. That's very nice. <laughs> How are you, sir? Very fine, very fine. Nice, yes, Scott. That's Good very nice. You. Very nice to see you all. Hi, Marcel. It's Don from Canada. <laughs> yes, Don from Canada. Of course, I know. <laughs> Mary Quill, Canada. <laughs> Mary Quill. <laughs> yes, very good, Don. Looking forward to this. It's it's really it's uh, we, it would be much nicer. We would be all together, you know. Yes. Hey. Yes, wonderful. Peter, Sir Peter from Atlanta. Very nice that you are also here. Boris Asabu, Imze. Safi Kabisa. It's very nice. So, Atlanta. Very nice to just, see you. you. You only just woke up, most probably. <laughs> oh, you know, for about 30 minutes. That's right. <laughs> good to see you. Very good to see you all. Thank Hello. you, Professor, for, for joining you. Thank you very Hi. much for, for, for organizing such a very nice uh, topic. As a PhD Hello, student, I hope I will be, I, I, I'll use many things. And thank you very much. I can learn from you. I'm Abdisa from Ethiopia, Jima University. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's very nice to really be connected. It would be much nicer. We would sit now at the same place and would have a a serious discussion, but also a serious party afterward, because we are we have done all so many things together over all these years. You see, party oh, sounds good, Marcel. How are you? Thank you, thank you, sir. Ay, 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 Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, uh, Marcel. I think, um, we we have to start now. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our master class today. Uh, the master that is going to uh, talk today is none other than Marcel Tan, who doesn't need any introduction. Um, but I'm very pleased that uh, Marcel Tana has um, spared time to share his wide, wide knowledge and wisdom uh, in public health, but uh, more specifically in malaria control. So I'm sure we'll all enjoy the show in the next two and a half to three hours. So Marcel Tana, most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Honorati and everybody. 
And thank you very much, uh, mainly uh, Fredas and Sheila, to bringing us together. And I'm, I'm ready now. Uh, thank you. As uh, Fredros will now climb into the cockpit together with Sheila. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks a lot to uh, our director, Dr. Robert Masanja, and thanks to Marcel for joining us for this masterclass today. Uh, I, I just like let, would like to let our um, viewers once again know that this is the 30th edition of the Ifakara Masterclasses. Um, we are very happy to be joined by you and by many others who will join us today. This session, as are the others uh, since the 16th, are being is being streamlined uh, live. Is being streamed live on, um, on on YouTube as well. And my colleagues from Ifakara, I kindly request you to share the YouTube link on on the chat here, just so others can have that. We welcome all our colleagues uh, from the Pacific to the Americas. Everybody is welcome, and uh, please uh, stay active on the chat as always. Uh, my colleague Sheila uh, Roma and myself will try to elevate as many of your questions as possible to our expert today. We will be talking mostly about malaria strategies, covering everything from the uh, early 2000s and probably before uh, to today. Uh, we expect a lot more people joining. There is about 300 people who registered for this class. Usually about half of that join in person and the rest uh, visit by YouTube. But uh, please feel welcome. And, um, and, and and let's move on. So back to you, Sheila. Yeah, thank you, Fred Ross. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so welcome to our participants. Um, today we have an interesting masterclass uh, by none other than Professor Master Osana. We are going to take a deep dive into the malaria strategies. Um, more specifically, starting with a deep dive into the WHO Strategic Advisory Group on Malaria Eradication, we are going to look at what the findings are and what they mean for us today in terms of where we are in um, where we are headed towards elimination and, of course, malaria control. We are also going to look at the different malaria strategies um, that are in place um, and also take a um, look back in the history of, of the development um, of these strategies and what we can learn, the lessons that we can pick from this, um, from the history of the malaria strategies. And then after that, of course, we are going to talk about um, the impact of health systems and how those impact malaria transmission, malaria control, as well as elimination. And um, as usual, we are also going to take um, a personal journey on Marcel Tana, about Marcel Tana, looking at career and of course, learning from his journey. Um, we expect that we have some young scientists on the line. And so we expect that we learn a lot from his, um, from his journey as well. So welcome to everyone. Please feel free to send any questions or um, chats or any uh, suggestions on the chat box. Please let's keep it lively. And if there are any questions that we need to elevate to Marcel Tana, we will do so um, at the opportune time. Um, and so Fred Rose, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Sheila, you did say that uh, we will be having uh, personal um, experiences from Marcel as well. And actually I would like us to begin from there. Marcel, I, I see your desk is a little empty now. I'm not sure if you stepped up for coffee or if you're still with us. Uh, you don't see me now. No. Uh, no, we don't. That's, that's but strange. It's, it's, but it's fine if, if you're there. Um, no. Yeah, so that's good now. That's good now. It's okay. Yes, yes it's okay. So, M Marcel, a lot of people look up to you, uh, including myself and Shayla, um, and, and you have impacted the lives of many, many academics and also many, many public health practitioners across Africa and beyond, actually, also in the Pacific. Uh, I would like us to request you to begin a little bit with a small narrative of how you arrived first in Ifakara in October of 1979 uh, in, in Africa, uh, what your life has been, what was the driving force then, and how this, uh, the, the changes that have happened in the continent have, have um, shaped your own development and growth in global health. So again, you can take any direction, but just a little bit of personal experiences of your own career growth uh, from the first time you arrived in Africa uh, several years back. Back to you, Marcel. 
Thank you very much, Fred Ross, and thank you very much, Sheila. And, uh, yes, wonderful to uh, see all those many dear friends and colleagues that we are now connected. I mean, Fred Ross question, how did I arrive? In a way, I, I mean, <laughs> as you know, <coughs> many of you, I mean, I was primarily interested in infection biology and in medical parasitology. And I, I was a lab researcher and I did my uh, PhD on sleeping sickness and growth condition of trypanosomes. And uh, parallel to that also, at that time we didn't have stipends uh, to uh, do the PhD. I was actually have an assistant position and was working on worms and filaria and in the lab as well and, uh, and the immune response and I did immunoparasitology and um, it was then in in 79 that I was um, going with the late uh, Professor Niklaus Weiss to Cameroon in order to collect uh, Oncocerca vulvulus adult worms because we wanted to extract antigens for a diagnostic test uh, uh, for the whole uh, big river blindness control program a, a diagnostic test. And so we went to the Western Cameroon, it, it, really into the bush. And uh, every day we stayed at a Catholic mission there and had one room as a lab. And we went every day to the field to uh, actually find patients, uh, of course, uh, remove the nodules and also treat them. Uh, and uh, this was for me a key um, key event because we will go went to these villages and the people didn't only have oncocerciasis as a problem, um, but had many other health problems, and that's actually where I understood social systems and health system for the first time, and uh, I really decided my way forward is really to go much more towards epidemiology and public health. But I was very glad that I did basic immunology, basic cell biology. And uh, so the idea was that I would start working in Liberia. The Liberian Institute for Biomedical Research that many people know was uh, famous for hepatitis research and close to the Firestone Plantation. But uh, this uh, work on this expedition where I also worked on schistosomiasis in, in Liberia, uh, in the field, identifying transmission sites. And then, as you know, 1980, uh, this all took a turn by the fact that uh, Taylor took over the shop in, uh, on the 14th of April, 1980. And uh, this was no longer possible to work there. And uh, as an alternative, already having visited as at Ifakara in 79, uh, they, they said, now, Marcel, now it's really now you have enough reasons to go to Tanzania. Because in 79, I was uh, in, in Tanzania. That was the last, that the last visit of Professor Gaigi, the founder of the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And I was the, my first visit together with Professor Freivogel, who was at that time, uh, his name was Ndege Uru for those uh, who are more Israeli fluent. Uh, actually, uh, it was his, uh, he took me along and, uh, and uh, showed me that there is a, a lot to do. And I liked, I liked Liberia, I liked Cameroon, I liked uh, uh, Tanzania very much uh, because it's really with the people working on things that are relevant, formulated by the people and not just uh, formulated by a career you want to do by doing a few experiments and a few publications. And Thank so you. I went to uh, Ifakara and uh, I mean, the first problem we had to solve already in 79 was the period when we had a cholera epidemic. So it was not a research doing research, but we were confronted with really public health issues. That's exactly what I was a little bit longing for. And uh, yes, so I my commitment to this type of work and have my joy and my satisfaction. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel. And, and after that, you, at some point in your career, you started to work on malaria. And, and a lot of our discussion today will actually focus on, on, on how the work that you have done and the work that many other people have done have actually transitioned, uh, transformed uh, the global and several national malaria control policies around the world. We would like to begin here with this conversation about this. I'm going to return it to Sheila briefly, uh, just to start us off on this malaria pathway. Sheila, please. Yeah, thanks, Fred. So Professor Marcel, to start us off, um, there's this publication, this work you did with um, Pedro Alonso, it was highlighting the challenges and prospects for malaria control and elimination. This was published in 2013 when we could see um, significant changes or improvements or the successes towards um, malaria control. Um, and, and some of the challenges, including fra fragility in health systems, the rights and spread of insecticide resistance and drug resistance as well. So looking back, where now we are not seeing any improvement, the improvement sort of the decline in malaria control has sort of stagnated. So looking back from this specific work, what can we add on or what can we change in terms of the challenges that we are facing now? Yes, it's very, it, this work actually, this uh, um, review that uh, Pedro and myself uh, were uh, writing was actually in preparation to achieve the global technical strategy. And I think this is actually, as you know, this was published in 2013, but actually in um, uh, 2015, we, we then could have this uh, global technical strategy for malaria control and the elimination endorsed by uh, all, uh, all member states of the World Health Organization. Now, I mean, at that time we were particularly focusing on really the systems part. That's why this is, was the first one. The resistance part as a threat, but also that actually, if we want to maintain momentum, it needs funds. So what can we add now? As you know very well, we actually have shown with the SACME report that uh, scientifically, it is feasible to achieve elimination and uh, maybe the ultimate goal of eradication. So to keep it this clear, but what we need to add is much more uh, really focus on the local setting. It's not just fragility of the systems, uh, but it is actually really tailoring a strategy to the local uh, health system. That's the most important point, because if you do this, then actually, you uh, also include, and that's very important, we did unfortunately not stress this enough in this review, uh, actually not mention that one of the key things is this tailoring is also to not to do monitoring and evaluation, but to do surveillance response. I think so that actually the surveillance, which operates with the minimal essential data in space and time, uh, that you actually, this surveillance uh, allows you to detect early where transmission occurs, where foci are, and to, uh, uh, to intervene with a response package that is uh, actually tailored to the setting. This issue would also cover uh, changes in detecting a resistance uh, problem, and actually it would also detect uh, where you actually meet, need to reinforce well, let's say supply chain, whatever. Your surveillance response is not only for a parasite or a disease, but it's also for systems issue to understand where something works or doesn't work, where processes are interrupted or delayed. And I think this is the point I would add uh, nowadays. I would not be so dramatic and say nothing has changed that we are now stagnating. Mm -hmm. I think you should not uh, forget that uh, if you really look at the landscape and the achievements where we have uh, uh, elimination or where we are on the way is um, are substantial, but we still have the problem of the high burden uh, countries, and that's where what I just said needs to be uh, needs to be reinforced. This tailoring to these high burden countries and not 
this blanket way to countries where they have a totally other situation in, in terms of focality versus those that have actually high levels of perennial transmission throughout. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marcel. And, and I mean, you mentioned uh, two important things. Uh, one is the, the, the questions about landscape, but you also talked about um, what would you do better. So we, we're going to skip this and I want you to go back to, to that, if you don't mind, to that strategy question. And here it is. So this is a data from uh, the GTS, from WHO, a projection of what it will cost to bring malaria under control. Uh, this is data that came much earlier. So we have projections up to 2020. This was the information that went into the global technical strategy. I have asked you this question directly before, but I think that for the benefit of, of our colleagues, it's something that you are probably the person who expresses its best. And so we're gonna ask you again today, Sheila and myself. And this is Marcel, assume that you had the magic wand uh, and you had all the cash that you need that we could actually reach these finance targets that we have 6.6 .6 billion USD annually uh, projected to be approximately 10 billion by 2030. If we actually had this cash, and you are in a position where you could make the decisions. What exactly would you do to bring malaria under control? Yes, I think, uh, this, uh, thank you for the question. I think the important point is that it's not just uh, the amount of money that you see here, but it is how you invest. And that's why your question is correct. How would you invest that? I mean, uh, there are, it's not in one, uh, in, uh, in, in one pl uh, place only, but one thing which always must be is really in this tailoring to the local setting. I think that is important. That's where we also can save money, that we are actually really tailor a strategy to the local setting. And tailoring to the local setting also entails that you are investing in, in personnel development, capacity building, that are specifically needed and not just offer a few stipends for whatever training, but really uh, uh, really going into investments that you can build the capacity in, and also investing in a, a, in a systemic approach so that people are not just hunting plasmodia and are feeling like a plasmodia, uh, but, uh, but actually are really also understanding the context, I mean, that's maybe my bias. That's what drove me to the field is actually trying to reconcile the different needs, but still to focus on, 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 the, key, on the key question. Second important point is, of course, what we still don't do enough is really that, uh, that the R&D, the R&D that helps the strategy, not just any R&D where then a scientist says, what I have discovered is, is really uh, of great use for the control and reducing burden, et cetera. No, it is actually which are really the research question we must uh, actually pursue, which products do we need? And here I think uh, an important reallocation is, it's not all R&D that actually should be supported, but those that lead to really transformative intervention. I mean, if you improve the sensitivity of an RTT where you show the picture a little bit, then you must always ask the question, what does this change? But if you, right. for instance, uh, uh, take a, a technology that really can make a big difference, then of course, with a tailored strategy and the big difference and the trained people, you can really show an impact. And the problem of high burden country is very typical for that. So, so two points you've raised here. One is that you, you need to structure the you need to organize the strategies uh, to be context specific, and the second is that you need to focus on high power uh, R and D. Uh, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about these concepts today, and, and we have a special set of questions on vaccines and, and some of the new uh, transform potentially transformative vector control tools, but very very slightly using the slide that we have projected there, what has been the most exciting development for you in the area of diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, and vector control? Just if you could list a few things that you have found yeah. most uh, interesting. Yeah. 
uh, the dear Fred Ross, you show it already. I think most exciting was uh, after having spent hours and hours looking down the microscope is to have actually the rapid diagnostic test and that uh, the, the RTTs, uh, actually also species uh, specific RTTs uh, are actually uh, uh, simply wonderful. And I find this exciting. I found it with all my bias also exciting the development of the combination therapies and the use of that one and actually and not just artemisinins, but actually really the combination therapy and the first development that went out of the co-artem development into the, into the broader drug R&D, where we know we need uh, the next drug. So for me, this is very exciting. The malaria vaccine, of course, uh, with a huge bias is something which I, I, I find we made steps. We thought it is easier. Uh, we have actually, uh, it took time, but I think the the uh, the the eleven centers across seven countries that tested RTSS is actually showing that it's the uh, it's it, the, the countries impacted by malaria themselves can really generate the information. And for me, most touching is that I was exactly two years ago going to uh, Ghana and seeing how. RTSS also incomplete, but it is the first uh, vaccine in a way was administered uh, to small children in Ghana uh, and in the not in the capital, but very far remote, uh, close to the border of Togo. So this is was the most important thing, and it's with the vaccine we will talk about. Wonderful that two weeks ago actually we could achieve. I can say we because I was involved that I, the, the um, inventor or part of it, of the mRNA vaccine for COVID, uh, they have agreed to really now try malaria as well. And the good thing was that also uh, now from the, there is a fund close to 200 million uh, uh, euros that are now liberated for these developments. And, uh, and, uh, and, that, uh, and these are very exciting. It doesn't mean that we are succeeding because malaria is much more difficult than a simple virus, I put it like that, uh, in, in terms of developing a vaccine. And with the vector control tools, I mean, I, I re look with great admiration uh, to you uh, with the development of the uh, public health entomology and all the new tools. Uh, going from uh, looking at the, the nets, the new net structures, material, also the IVCC, of course, this is something very important. That's where things happen and they are directed towards uh, uh, producing new transformative tools, including there also the gene drive, which we have to uh, pursue because that could be a real transformative uh, technologies as well as more on the community level, uh, the famous well-being box, where you actually combine a, a mosquito trap with the facility to provide little electricity to the most remote places. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Marcel. And we, we're going to have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you already mentioning some of the specifics like the mRNA vaccine issues, that, that, that's a, a very exciting, exciting news. We, we talked about, uh, my colleague Sheila says that we can proceed, so this is fine. We talked a little bit about the cash uh, question. And actually when, when uh, uh, Sheila was asking you earlier about your paper, one of the things, uh, sorry, my slides are misbehaving. One of the, the points that you raised with Pedro at the time was the idea that the costs were going to increase, the, the cost of goods was going to increase partly because the population is increasing and, and so on and so forth. For most countries, Marcel, when you show them these numbers, like this is what it will cost, they get a mm -hmm. bit scared for good reason. If you look at this figure, you see the, globe, uh, the, uh, the GDP of per course. capita for most African countries. It's, it's below a thousand for so many of these countries per capita. So can you try and make an economic case here for malaria elimination or malaria eradication? But just yeah. for elimination country by country, can you in, in the simplest way possible as someone who has worked on this 
in this space for a long time. What is the economic case for a low income country with so low GDP to, to eliminate malaria? Yeah, I mean, the important point, and I think this is very important that you show the heterogeneity. One, I think this is very important. And uh, if you talk to a more blue or a, or, or a more lightish green country here if this map, then of course it comes easily up. It's not ju just to look at how poor or how rich we are, but it is actually what is actually the investment we can make. That's also the point, not only to external donors, but also the, the, the domestic funding issue. You justify the economic case for return uh, uh, of investment. And I think uh, in the AIM report, which went parallel to the, uh, to the global technical strategy, uh, one puts a ratio of uh, one in 60 or one in 40, depending on how you calculate. But the fact that you have an, in, an, an investment that out of $1 invested, you get 40 back, let's leave at the lower one or 30 back, this is actually the place where you can convince, uh, particularly at government level, finance ministers uh, really to consider this seriously because you then not only look at malaria and the high return of investment, but because of what we discussed before, because it's a systemic intervention, you strengthen the health system. It's not just the labor market in a way, but that sometimes people single out, but it is actually this a return of investment compared to other investment you make that ma it makes the case. But I think, of course, this is a, a case to make, but afterwards it has to go into the priority setting and resources allocation process. And there, in many governments, wherever they are, people then forget about return of investment. They actually look just, what? how does my finance plan of the year look like? And because the return of investment doesn't come back immediately, then the finance ministers uh, forget about uh, what they initially claimed wonderful, but they forget about it because it takes too much time. This comes back or is not directly visible uh, in the, in, for the population, uh, but uh, and for the overall uh, for the overall economy it is, but over a longer period. So this would be my argument on return of investment, and this then will show, and this is where I've, for instance, shown with the malaria discussion, uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, the ma malaria vaccine discussion, that it depends very much where you would use an uh, incomplete vaccine like RTSS, and we have published on that one by showing, uh, showing uh, uh, that you cannot use it just as a blanket everywhere, but it is really this way, this investment that you have to think about for the benefit that you obtain, yeah? Thank you very, very much. And, and I mean, we are inviting our colleagues on the line as well. If anybody has any specific questions on this line, uh, before we proceed, I just wanna raise, elevate one question from uh, uh, Max in there. Uh, Marcel, often people do not talk about this. Those are the health system gains in business cases um, they're presented as if only for malaria and no other can, uh, outcomes or capacity development. So I guess the, the question here is, are there any positive externalities beyond the gains in malaria control that we would see on other diseases if we invested on malaria control? Yes, I think so. I think this, uh, Maxine is absolutely right. And this thinking in investment cases, but in systems intervention investment cases, it, 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 it is far uh, uh, too absent in the discussion. The good example is, is again, and you may say Marcel is a bit obsessed with that, but it is it's surveillance response. If a country in, in invests actually in surveillance and response packages, in a way, this is actually having a broad effect. You, of course, you are actually setting it up now in many countries for itchy malaria, in some countries, they set it up for, uh, for uh, zoonotic diseases like Ebola and so on. But whatever you do, if you, you, need, you cannot hunt a germ, but you must actually have a system to capture changes. And that actually is really something which will have a broad effect 
on the functioning of the system. And that's where also it pays off what, what um, Maxine Ray writes, the capacity of development issue. Because if you have people who know how to do the surveillance, but also to act, not just say, oh, I've seen a chain, but also act in a public health way, this has an enormous gain and reduces a, a, a lot of um, costs, particularly in Africa. If you look at too many countries have still a, a, a filaria program, an onco program, they have a, a, a sleeping sickness program, but actually the whole way to take the DRC, uh, the, the whole way to really serve these people and detect these foci is only possible in a comprehensive approach. There, the investments in one uh, comprehensive surveillance system is less than having keeping all these vertical teams running. And, and, and. Yeah, thank you. Sheila, do you have addition? Yeah, Professor, so um, taking you back to a topic that is really close to your heart, like you mentioned, surveillance and response. Could you please talk to us a little bit more on this specific topic? What does surveillance and response mean? Surveillance and response is actually the feasible way of monitoring and evaluation. I start with the other end. Monitoring and evaluation where everybody is keen and many people suffer is that is it, you, you collect maximum possible data and then it goes to a central place and then you have gigabytes that are not uh, uh, evaluated. A bad example, I dare to say, is, are these malaria indicator surveys. If you have every month to report over 500 indicators, and if we discuss it with specialists or academics, they add five other indicators. But uh, uh, the surveillance, if you are in charge of a health system, if you have to act for the people, you must have the minimum essential data in space and time. So how do I look at a, a region, at a district, at a country that I detect where new transmission occurs, where, or where I detect that resistance uh, comes up, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually a surveillance of change. And this you must, cannot impossibly do with a malaria indicator survey. You can only do it with a well-designed minimal essential data. And then you must have, and that's the response, you must have for a specific setting also what you do. Do you go and uh, spray all the houses or do you go and uh, look at the bed net use and so on? So it is not everywhere the same response when you de detect transmission. So I mean, yeah. an, ex an example is the Chinese have I mean, they now propagated for the whole world, but that's another problem. But the 137 strategy of China is actually such an example of rapidly identifying and acting. Mm. So how does this play out in the high burden, high impact countries? In the high burden and high impact countries, there is a different way of doing that. I mean, surveillance response is a particularly something uh, and that is important for an elimination setting. If you take, for instance, uh, um, a, a famous map that we always show is how Tanzania has started. And then after uh, 15 years, uh, uh, there, is, there are foci, there's a big change before Tanzania with the first map uh, uh, survey, it was all red. And nowadays you have a big heterogeneity. So in such a situation, you, you need surveillance response in the different districts. Zambia is a similar example. They started also with a higher transmission and then it goes down and you go to the subnational level. But for the high burden countries you have there, when you start in a high burden country, universal health coverage issues are much more important that you actually bring in uh, the access to bed nets, the access to early diagnosis and treatment, that's where you don't need surveillance response, that you just have to install, that actually you can rapidly diagnose and treat, and you actually have uh, also uh, the, the bed nets in place. And once you do this, and this can be shown with the data 
when we have from year 2000 to about 2015, then you can have a huge impact on transmission. And then a country that has one color of intensity of transmission becomes very fragmented. And you have then foci of transmission of higher and lower transmission. And that's where uh, the surveillance response pays best off. And that's where you, you sh should stop with just the <laughs> gatherer operation of collecting Thank data. Thank you. So, so essential points here, instead of the so-called hunter-gatherer monitoring and evaluation, you need a much more uh, systematic surveillance response operation, especially in areas approaching elimination. You've also said that for high burden, high impact, uh, high burden countries, you need to address much more the issues of universal health coverage, uh, deploy as, as, as much as you can the, the core interventions and, 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 and follow up from there, not necessarily trying to collect every variable. Uh, that's necessary. The, the third point that you raised, which I thought was really important, is the question of minimum essential data in space and time. Thank you so much, Marcel. Let's proceed. And, and I think the, the next best point for us to go is the SAGME report, the so-called SAGME, SAGME report. <laughs> now, 2016, the, the World Malaria, uh, the, the WHO director, it comes to Marcel, requests you to put together this team uh, or, or puts together this team which you chaired uh, and asks you the question, what are the benefits? What are the scenarios? Can we actually eliminate malaria? What would be the benefit? Is this, is this possible? I would like you to talk to us a little bit about this process and what came out of this initiative at a time when, you know, uh, some might already say it's too early, some might say it's too late, you know. And I don't want us to go into the discussion with the Landsat Commission, I just focus on the on the SAGME report. Back to you, Masa. Thank you very much. I mean, this was an exciting undertaking because uh, the good thing was actually that the question was not asked, is it politically feasible, or, uh, but is actually a, a call to the scientists from the different disciplines to say, uh, is it feasibly on the scientific ground, also taking into account long-term uh, 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 trends as like urbanization issues, like demographic changes, population dynamics and so on, and the climate change as well, also the whole ecosystem changes. And I think on the one hand, you have these trends and where we are in many things, uh, not cl very clear how we uh, what these trends really mean for the whole of the world, because we to look ahead in, in, in time for decades, but we anyhow try to tackle that with a scientific approach. And the most important problem, when you ask a little bit how we did this, was that many people had a confusion in their head that they thought they must give a political statement and the most crucial thing, and I don't go into Lancet Commission discussion, but it's anyhow, it's anyhow uh, important, is the date of er eradication. And, uh, and as a scientist, you can never come up with a date, because if we on one hand have found with the scientific analysis in the long-term trend context, you cannot achieve this uh, goal with tailored strategies, as I said at the very beginning, at one given date, that on the 31st of December 2050, uh, for instance, you are there. Because the way how you adapt the tailored strategy, the way how you, be it also how you have the people, the manpower, is, is impossible on scientific ground to have a clear finishing line. But it is the, the approaches, and I think this was, the for me, scientifically, the most interesting thing is that one critically looked at one disease in, a, in the context of a whole social ecological system. And so it is, Thank you. Yeah. and I think that is the thing which we try to express and if people say we are not concrete, but I think we are very concrete on so, the so point we, we're gonna, we're of gonna the ask tailoring. You to, we're going to ask you to focus a little bit more on that, actually, uh, because 
it, for many of us, this is the first time we see a report that does not just look at malaria itself, but also looks at other global trends. We, we projected there uh, a slide with some information from this report. Uh, three key points coming out is that even with the best possible scenarios, we would still have about 11 million cases in 2050. Exactly. Uh, and you, you go on to then say what the priority should be and, and, and all that. Talk to us a little bit about that, Marcel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is very easy to put three points here. Uh, and uh, but actually to achieve that rating that one i think the important thing is really this first point is that whatever you do and also and here is a long-term trade is demographics which is very difficult to predict because population dynamics is not just growth it is the dynamics how people move and the ecological changes uh, uh, drive people uh, to to migrate to move and all this actually, this is a very conservative uh, estimate. And it's not to make uh, really uh, great panic, but I mean, whatever you do and whatever you model, and, and also when you look precisely at case studies that you bring together, you will still have these 11 million cases, which of course is much, much less than what you have now, but it is a substantial amount. And uh, and uh, uh, I mean, the priority to establish a foundation for a successful future er eradication is really this having the nationally, that you have the global technical strategy, national setting and not having, we have a national brand, we add the GTS, that's not going to work. GTS is not the tail of the national uh, strategy. The GTS is a framework that you need to bring into the national strategy. And I think that you need to establish, that's the important foundation. And of course, and of course, a part of the foundation is to keep the R&D process running, the R&D process running, and not just to say, we try first with what we have. You need this iterative way with the new transformative technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila, please. Yeah, thanks, Fred. So we are going to elevate um, a question from Anton Alexandra, who is asking, to what extent do you subscribe to Malaria Solutions being 20% technology, science, knowledge, and 80% engagement uh, with the community, that is education, health system, programs, and the people who run the show? Master. Yes, I, I mean, uh, these, uh, these figures, um, I'm not so much on these figures, but I mean, this is appropriate uh, to show uh, that so many of you know, actually, uh, what particularly together with Don the Savenue, uh, uh, who, uh, who is uh, here uh, as well, we stressed a lot that actually the efficacy of a tool is, is, is a lot, but actually you carry it to the communities is, is really uh, to reach effectiveness. And that's why these 80% that you correctly mentioned, Sheila, are really uh, the effort that you, you, you really need to think about. Uh, because if you have, I mean, I always said this with a little bit uh, military comparison, it's uh, the question of magic bullet and magic gun. And uh, if you have the magic bullet, that means a highly efficacious intervention, then you need this is not dangerous for nobody, it's just bullets. But if you have the magic gun, which is actually the health and social system, to bring it to the people to use, uh, to, to accept, then we are really, uh, 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 then uh, things are, uh, then you are really effective. And that's why this 80% is, is for me a, 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 a correct weight in the whole story. Yeah, thank you. So back to malaria eradication um, and thinking about um, the BMGF um, strategy um, towards elimination, are we running a risk here when we say, um, when we think about or when we focus on malaria eradication, what lessons can we learn from this? The, 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 the eradication is the aim for the global level. And I think it's a, uh, we, we, the lesson we should learn, the 
eradication word is like a star that we use to navigate, but we cannot grab. But actually what we can grab is a local situation where in a country and there we think of elimination. I must say that many scientists and uh, politicians, particularly also, they are, I cannot distinguish between that one because it is, it, it is wrong to speak in, in a country, we go for eradication. The country can only go for elimination and it makes a contribution to the effort of eradication. And this actually is then not wrong and also does not, which you have here highlighted in red, uh, promise too early. I mean, we, we never promise eradication. We can promise for a given setting elimination and eradication remains the navigation point, fixed point uh, for our orientation. And then uh, this issue of risk of donor and political fatigue cannot occur because the donor and political fatigue is uh, on the global level very quickly there if you promise too much. Because if then you have a slogan-based health development, which is never going to work in a country on elimination, you have a very concrete plan. You want to detect where transmission occurs. You want uh, uh, the transmission to interrupt. And you want actually that you have no in new introduction. And that's concrete and is, is not uh, creating this, uh, this problem. Sorry, I was, I was muted. Thank you, Marcel. Back to you, Fredros. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Marcel, for the clarification and also the, the, the lessons as we, we raised here uh, from, from your SAGME reports. It was important for us uh, to, to just see the, the key points here. I mean, if, if you relate this to a lot of the things that were happening a few years ago where we still had the shrinking the map idea, uh, uh, and, and here you clearly state that whoever is interested in contributing to this eradication agenda must go to the hardest places. And I think that's important. Uh, and, and also the point that you say about how do we align the global technical strategy to the national strategies. So I think that is all great. Before we finish this story of eradication, I want us to bring, to go back to some of the, the, the additional lessons beyond malaria uh, and, and hear your thoughts on how uh, uh, these ones can inform our own fight. There are only two diseases that have been eradicated. The first is smallpox in the 1980s. In uh, 1979, you had the, 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 the last stamp, as you can see there from uh, eradication in Africa. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, this, uh, you have the cases um, um, of, of rinderpest. This is a cattle disease uh, that was also more recently eradicated less than 20 years ago. Marcel, talk to us a little bit about whether there are any lessons we can get from these two diseases uh, that will be applicable for malaria elimination by country level. Thank you very much. I, I, I think we should, um, uh, the lessons starting with smallpox is uh, going uh, to, to what we just discussed. I think uh, the smallpox vaccination strategy also, we had there a very, a very beautiful uh, vaccine you could put in your pocket. You don't need a freezer. You had the bifurcated needle, many of you know very well. And the important thing is you did not even know, need a vaccination certificate because the uh, a smallpox vaccination was very visible. And I think this was all, uh, it was very visible and, and the diseased person as well. So uh, this was all very easy. But the start, what we learned, and what smallpox eradication also learned, is that with the Biafra war situation, when they didn't have enough vaccine, they started the ring vaccination around a case they detected, instead of just blanket rolling, in this case, through Nigeria and vaccinating everybody. One surveillance response is this because you, you detect a diseased uh, person, you actually run there, verify the diagnosis and you vaccinate people around them. And this ring vaccination has actually saved uh, the few vaccines that were around, but allowed the targeted, as we discussed before intervention. That's what we learned there. 
and uh, and it, it's uh, and in the Rinderpest, I think here we had uh, very much also known a, a very clear strategy. Uh, of course, again, detecting the cases was very important so that you knew where you have to intervene. And I think it goes back to what we discussed before. So one cannot emphasize enough this surveillance part in order to adapt the strategy, a strategy that just looks at the country that where you have a homogeneous distribution, homogeneous outbreak is not the reality. It is very good to have a, a strategy to put in your folder, but it is not the strategy that you can give your, uh, your, your, your people who have to do the job. And I think this is something which, uh, what, we, what, we, what we clearly learn. And, and with this, I mean, um, surveillance becomes itself an intervention. Surveillance is not just a, a tool and you then detect maybe something. No, the good surveillance is the intervention. That's what we learn from uh, these cases where we have been successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have much more recent uh, cases here. Um, uh, uh, of polio, which is only declared, uh, Africa has only been declared polio free since 2020. Um, and we have the case of Guinea worm, which is very close, exactly. and the dragon of Medina, uh, very close. My friend Philip uh, Wilkoff likes to talk, a, 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 to, to refer a lot to the fight to get malaria, um, polio out of Nigeria as something that we could use as an example that we could use of how we could use data uh, specifically to uh, support malaria eradication as, or elimination in, in some countries as well. Marcel, do you have anything that you would like to add uh, on top of what you said about smallpox and rinderpox uh, that was applicable to polio and, and maybe guinea worm that you think we can yeah, follow from the malaria fight? And Fred Ross, I mean, and all, I mean, this, uh, what we, what, what I said to smallpox actually, comes back to, uh, to the guinea worm as well as to the polio. I think the, it's very good that we add that one and you challenge me on that one. But uh, the only way actually that you get uh, close to the guinea worm is to detect where you still have one uh, guinea worm uh, and then you actually uh, 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 do the measures. It's much easier, of course, than polio. I mean, we have here the map you show, uh, you have the situation in in the Afghanistan, Pakistan area. Uh, here we know that the situation is difficult because of the uh, unstable social political uh, situation. And therefore this is even much more, but it is really detecting where, uh, where you have the foci. And I mean, with polio, we have uh, the other problem that of course uh, we have the, uh, the difficulty with the um, uh, polio uh, uh, vaccine, the life one that also can actually uh, be uh, trans, uh, transmitted in the outside. We have a transmission where also the environment is involved and they, it can revert to a wild type and so on. We all know this, so this, there are other complexities, but to detect this all again is the good surveillance system that, that you detect early when such changes happening. And I think it's, it goes all back to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, issue, besides some, of course, operational issues and so on, which would go too far to go on that one, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel, for the clarifications. Back to you, Sheila. You're muted. Uh, yeah. Ma yeah, thank you. Um, Marcel, so looking at the global trends that are likely to have an impact on malaria transmission, so focusing on poverty reduction, population growth, um, agricultural use and urbanization, as well as climate change. So you notice that most of these are not brought into conversations by malariologists. Malariologists don't focus on these aspects. So how do we ensure that these trends are brought on board by ma ma malariologists. How do we, do we ensure that we are having conversations around this? Yes, I think this is, uh, I mean, how do we ensure? I mean, we, we tried with the SACME report to provide a report that took these dimension into account. And 
I, I would dare to say that uh, some of the uh, scientists, but also, let's say, the, uh, uh, the, the public health uh, workers actually have, have realized that the SAGMI report takes these trends into account and still says elimination is possible and eventually eradication, uh, despite of the huge complexity of these uh, six words that you have thrown at us here. But I mean, the, the way how you get the malariologist, I think, first of all, we should not have mariologist. I mean, I'm, I would myself not never call a mariologist. I mean, can hardly pronounce it correctly in English. I mean, <laughs> I would rather say, I mean, here you need, a, it, it's, it's a public health scientist with a speciality in let's say infectious diseases is a speciality in in health system, but it is actually it 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 is the way how we train people. I mean, we cannot just for each we cannot now not COVID nineteen uh, specialists now uh, we, we, the ones who bring in the most important suggestions on how a country copes with are not coronavirus virologists. But I think it is really uh, people who, who see the, the public health context. And I think this is uh, something that you, uh, that you also work in mixed teams. In, in, uh, in, uh, then, then this automatically comes. But I think we are fundamentally uh, to, to focus on that uh, in, in, in the whole training and capacity building. That's where the chance is. And starting also with the very young generation that not somebody says, I specialize on HIV, I specialize in malaria. But I think people should see where are the diseases of neglect? Where are the diseases of poverty? And if you say this already, you cannot care for the disease so much, but you must care for the disease, the neglected people and the neglected system, because that's the triangle that we have to, to, uh, to, to bring to people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so a follow up on that. Do you have any examples or experiences of where this has been successful? Yes, I, 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 I think so. We, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the training that uh, when you look back at, um, at many of the programs of courses that are uh, brought in, uh, one tries to open uh, the blinkers of uh, the silo scientist and uh, and tries to to show the the, the contextual part and uh, still a lot to be done and also our course on signs of eradication is actually uh, uh, it, it's it, the first title is not malaria eradication it's signs of eradication where we try to bring in and i know that now a few of former course participants are even listening uh, today, I mean, they have actually had to think broadly and not just plasmodia, malaria, and ophelis. And, uh, and uh, I think the triangle was always a disease, a, a system, health and social system, as well uh, as, a, a, as, a pop, as a population. And with this, actually, we, we, we try to do that, but much more, much more needs to be done and not specifically on malaria, you see. When, when we go around and uh, have a particularly settings where resources are constrained, uh, I cannot stand that then in, in the public health offices or in the Ministry of Health, somebody says, oh, I only deal with HIV. I only deal with uh, malaria. Because this is the same populations or a large overlap of population that is confronted and you must bring this in this societal and systems context. That's interesting, Marcel. Uh, oh, sorry, Sheila, I don't want to... Did I no, go, go ahead, go ahead, Richard. Marcel, this is very interesting. Uh, in in a, um, a side conversation we, we had with uh, Professor Diane Wath, who has also uh, done a masterclass for us, uh, she was reminding us of uh, a story told to her by Julio Frank, um, 
uh, Uliu Frank. Uh, yes, well, well known, yeah. Very well known in WHO. Uh, who, do, who, who talks of a T-shaped individual? So, uh, you know, you're very deep on your own uh, vertical field of expertise, but you're also aware and have good knowledge of everything else that's happening. Do you worry that the current training of uh, people who work on malaria specifically or other diseases is too focused? Uh, that I mean, I, I, I know many very, very good scientists who have a very specific, even in our own um, um, society of mosquito, people studying mosquitoes, that there are a group of people who, who know exactly, who know only one aspect of the mosquitoes. I know someone can say, I study only the mating biology of malaria mosquitoes, or I study only uh, the, the gonotrophic cycle, or I study only the red blood cell, or I study only the vaccines that infect liver stage. And, and that's all they want to talk about. Do, we, do you worry that the training we have right now is too focused uh, to provide solutions? No, in many places, this is the case. And I, I hear I speak also in my position that I have now since years is as president of the uh, Swiss Academies of uh, Arts and Sciences of all. And I mean, here I, I see that it is the science culture. It's not the question of malaria or HIV or I don't know what or vectors. It's the science culture that drives the scientists to focus on one issue and to produce papers on these issues and that's how it, they are measured and if they are actually uh, if they are broader and so on uh, the, the, the T shapes they have not the classical which I think are crap these indicators of uh, of impact factor and age indices because a T-shaped person is a, is is a, is and I, I mean Julio told me the same issue. I mean I think it was even together with Diane. Uh, uh, but I think this is our culture of science and the values that actually individuals are uh, decorated with these factors. The monument carving exercise of some uh, scientists. I think the old dinosaurs. We, we, we bring the bad uh, examples to, to, the, to the young generation. And I think it is, uh, that's why I say, I was not thinking about T-shape or whatever shape. I mean, I, I was just put into a situation where I realized that you can only be T-shape to survive, to make a contribution. And, and I think that's very important that you actually can have the joy, and I think that is something which we have to communicate. You know, being a scientist has actually is carried by three choice. The joy to discover, that is actually to do science, to ask a question. The joy to share is, for instance, to be here in this webinar. And the third one is the joy to see and be involved in translation that something changes. My uh, famous mutual learning for change. These three points, these three choices, are actually carrying us through life. That is actually where the satisfaction comes. And our educational system does not, they say, oh, you know, poverty is a big problem, we must do research. If you are just concerned, if you cannot laugh, then you will never discover anything. You are just concerned. Everything is complex. You have to have it in a holistic view and all these things. Instead of just saying, I'm interested. I'm enthused by the fact that I can also share my knowledge and not say it's my study. I cannot yet share the data because, uh, uh, because I first want to write the publication. And it's not yet sure. That's crap. It's, it's, it's wonderful to share the data at any time, because we learn together to make a real difference. And the science system must honor uh, and, and uh, reward this type of attitude and not the mono, uh, monument carving uh, metric system. So at least we should adhere to the DORA principles. But I think much more needs to be done. Then this changes. The joy to discover, the joy mm -hmm. to share, and the joy to translate. Is that yeah. a good summary? Yes, yes. 
Thank you. Marcel, we want to continue a little bit on this specific subject of the other global trends. And of one specific case that we want to focus on is uh, urbanization. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my friend Abdislam Noor, WHO, described this as follows. Even though the actual malaria prevalence in our cities is much lower than in rural areas, the magnitude of the burden can be so big and so dispersed purely because of the actual number of people who live in these cities. Yes. And this means that even if prevalence is presented as zero point, you know, a percentage point of what is raised in rural areas, the resources that we will need for malaria elimination might actually be much higher for urban areas. We would like to hear from you, Marcel, what your thoughts are on how urban malaria or malaria in urban areas will impact the efforts in Africa and beyond to eliminate malaria overall. Uh, it's as if you do not recognize urbanization and what the effects is and only think that urbanization is bringing more concrete and therefore less breeding sites, then of course you make a huge mistake and you have no contribution to an elimination effort in a, in, in, in a country. So urbanization is a, a point where you must put a large focus uh, on it. And here we see the picture of, 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 uh, of Lagos. Uh, Lagos. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I have, I use in my lecture very often a picture of course from Dar es Salaam. And here we actually have made huge efforts in the 60s, 70s in mosquito control overall in the town. But with urban agriculture and with actually using each real space and in the more affluent places, having in the gardens very beautiful breeding sites, actually you, you change the situation in a very major way. And uh, for instance, I remember very well when the Tazara, for those who don't know that, the Tanzania Sambin Railway um, main station in Dar es Salaam was built, which was close to a little bit um, a poor area. They were also building staff houses there. I have a very beautiful picture to show that. And uh, then all these, let's say the mid-level staff of the Tazara, they had also their small gardens, the sweet potato hill beds. And this collected wonderfully uh, all the mosquitoes. And so a poor area, which didn't have mosquitoes actually, were, was with the transformation, with the, with the establishment of these staff quarters, suddenly the poor people suffered more. So it's th these changes also, it's not only the population change, but the changes in these breeding sites. And, and, and I think that's something, if you do not look at that one, you, uh, you, you, you really overlook a big thing. So, and so it can be vary from a small area in town where you have a big burden or suddenly a new burden to a population. And I think this heterogeneity dynamics you must actually follow again in a way that you survey and know where this is. And this comes then to interventions in such areas, maybe better than in the big Kilombero Valley, you have then more chances, for instance, with larvae siding, because you know which, uh, which, uh, which, which, where are the breeding sites that you can specifically intervene. But again, you must do the surveillance to find it. And, and you must, uh, consider Noor is, is right because the higher resources doing a town as we see here in the picture to do this type of surveillance that is intensive this you cannot just do by letting a drone fly and you because you this you don't discover and so yeah. there is there are efforts you see and that's why it it, it, it is a in, huge investment that needs to be made and should not be neglected you see yeah, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I think this is a, an, in, an incredibly important uh, uh, point. Um, uh, Sheila, do you want to ask, uh, uh, continue the discussion with Marcel on this? Yeah, Fred, so it got me thinking. We had previously a masterclass on Anopheles Stephensai. 
But then thinking about urbanization and Stephen Tsai, I wonder, Marcel, what your thoughts are on the risk or the threats of an off Stephen Tsai in African urban areas? We have uh, uh, some information on that one. And uh, I think it's, this is just an example that we have actually to be aware that we can have uh, shifts in vectors and yeah. through biotopia. I think this is a broader question. It's not Stefan Tsai. It's also the whole question of replacement vectors and so on. Uh, I think this is would be a, a whole masterclass as such, you see. Right. Yeah, back yeah. to Thanks. Thanks a lot. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, points here. Uh, um, I, I, it's really uh, eye opening to have this discussion because for most people, we have this linear view that with urbanization, malaria will go down. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, as much as that is true, the 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 investment you need to eliminate it becomes much higher because. It's just very difficult to do surveillance responses and, and also the number of people there is, is very high. The other point that, that you raised, which, which we thought was very important, is that when you start developing a place in the early days, such as the example you gave with the Tazara railway, that this might then expose the people who previously didn't have this risk exactly. at all. And, and that, that is important that we address. Thank you so much, Marcel, for that. Uh, uh, we will be elevating additional questions on the chat as well as we go. But for now, let's continue. A may, may, may I just a small thing, uh, dear yes, Fred, oh, sorry to yeah. interrupt. But I think what we learn actually is in overall disease control, we must be able to identify heterogeneities and the changing heterogeneities. We never have enough resources, so we must actually always use where there is most in a way. And, and intervene. And I think understanding how heterogeneity is changed by the new building as an example, but by many other things with water resources development, we know that. I think that's a lesson in public health. You must identify heterogeneities. You must not uh, uh, identify the homogeneity. Then you can be effective even with limited resources. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Let us move a little to the to the east. Uh, not maybe not. Should you say east or let's move towards the Pacific a little oh. and talk about uh, 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 Southeast Asia rather and talk about a challenge that is also kind of brewing and uh, not not being talked about in enough detail but important. And also, we would just like to mention that we've had uh, two incredible masterclasses. Uh, uh, by our colleagues from uh, from Southeast Asia, from the Pacific. Um, we spoke to Indra uh, Vitilingam, Professor Indra Vitilingam from Malaysia, uh, who talked to us about monkeys, mosquitoes, and malaria. And we recently had a, a repeat class with her and, and our colleagues. Now, one of the things that has come up in recent years is the question of anophilates of plasmodium nolesi. This is mm -hmm. now the fifth uh, species of human malaria. Now, Marcel, to begin, in the, in the 19th century, um, when yellow fever was still, the etiology of yellow fever was still not very well described, people assumed that it was possible to eradicate yellow fever. Um, uh, uh, and then we had this uh, discovery of the sylvatic cycles in the forest. And all of a sudden, it was very clear that even if you had a good vaccine, you are not going to eradicate this disease because you have this transmission happening in the wild in a zoonotic form. And now we have a similar case kind of coming up with, with in, in the case of malaria, no clear evidence yet that there's transmission from human to human, but there's some, a little bit of evidence on that, but not, not strong. What are your thoughts on how this will impact the desire of a country like Malaysia or many other countries around there to be certified malaria free? And how should no, I think it, 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 when you think about certification and time, of course, it will uh, still be a, a little bit of a problem that you actually, again, discover where these foci uh, actually of this zoonotic jump over into humans uh, occur. But I, I, I acknowledge that it is something that is growing. Uh, no less I is, is, is something it's good that we learn about it. But I say it is not a real threat 
to the, uh, all our elimination efforts because we know it, what it can be. We can diagnose it. And we also uh, uh, know that in these areas, uh, we must be careful that we have no uh, transmission then uh, from um, uh, from uh, the monkeys now to, to man. I mean, the, the, the yellow uh, fever uh, story is a different one. I mean, the sylvatic cycle was between the Colobus monkeys and Aedes africanus. And it, it uh, but the problem was not the Colobus monkey, uh, but uh, the baboon. You know, the, there you have a bigger problem because these baboons, they go into the bush, but they come to your garden. And all those of you who have had baboons in the garden, you know, these are very, I mean, this looks nice, but they are very nasty boys. And even the, the dogs are afraid. Derek Childwood, who listens uh, here, or is still here, has an experience with the dog uh, uh, being attacked by a baboon. And, uh, and, uh, and these baboons carry then, and that's the important thing, the, 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 the yellow fever to the human communities. And from there, you have Edis aegypti. So you don't need Africanos anymore. Once the baboon has carried it into human settlement, this is a bit different here. In the in the no lazy epidemiology, if you look at it, you don't have this massive transfer in a way from the uh, from the forest into the human settlement. So that's why, and we and we know that, and therefore I don't think that's the the key thing now that every week body should focus on. It's again something which we know that in Malaysia we have that. So we have again. The surveillance question, I'm nearly get boring this whole thing, and I always say, it, <laughs> but but I think here we, we can handle it like that. That's that's good. That's good. That's good. No, thanks a lot. Uh, Sheila, do you have any additional questions here? No, Fred Ross, please go ahead. Brilliant. Uh, Marcel, thank you so much. That means we can actually close this chapter as such. We don't have to, to uh, move forward, but I'm, I'm, impre I'm happy that you say we shouldn't worry so much about that uh, uh, going forward. And thanks also for the explanation, the additional explanation uh, on the story of baboons and yellow fever. Now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you mentioned earlier uh, the question of mRNA vaccines. Uh, and Marcel, uh, we have seen a lot of stories in recent times about RTSS uh, piloting happening in three countries in Africa. RTSS was, of course, as you described earlier, our most advanced malaria vaccine. Uh, some heterogeneity, yes, but evidence suggests that in high transmission settings, it would relieve us a lot of pain, will save a lot of lives. <clears throat> in recent uh, months, we have seen a study by the Jena, by, by Oxford uh, uh, crew, uh, also done in West Africa, suggesting that R21 uh, matrix vaccine is also very powerful, uh, giving you up to 75% protection right of, uh, uh, after the rains. Um, just two weeks ago, we have the publication by the Sanaria group on uh, uh, PFSPZ uh, CVAC, which is yes, yes. my colleagues at Efakara are very enthusiastic about. And, and we had a, a fantastic masterclass uh, with Steve Hoffman himself, uh, uh, co-moderated by Dr. Ali Olotu. Uh, and now we have the story of mRNA vaccine. All these are very exciting on the vaccine space. And we would just like to hear from you, Marcel, a little bit about real, uh, realism, you know, how realistic should, are this, how feasible will this be? How, how excited should we be about them? Or is it just another one of those stories that I read in Malaria Capos many years ago, you know? Is, is this actually eventually going to bring something that, that RTSS story, R21, uh, uh, CVAC, PFSPZ, whether irradiated or CVAC, and then the BioNTech mRNA. What are your thoughts here? Oh, this is a long thing. That is a whole masterclass on that whole thing. But I have had, I can say that the privilege and pleasure to be involved from the very beginning in 1992, when together with Pedro Alonso, uh, uh, we coordinated the first African malaria vaccine trial in 92 with the famous, infamous uh, SPF 66, uh, with the equally famous, infamous confidence interval of uh, efficacy 31%, 0 to 52. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but this actually, uh, why do we still now still work on that one? Very simple, because the establishment of semi-immunity, as well as the fact 
that you can actually transfer uh, um, uh, 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 protection by antibodies as well as the very early uh, uh, sporozoite irradiation uh, experiments in the US in the 70s actually show that it is possible to raise a protection against uh, malaria. And then under this outlook, knowing that even if we are not so successful, uh, we, we actually, the vaccine as part of an integrated strategy, you know, again, the response package we start discussed one hour ago, uh, then as part of that one, and as we say for RTSS, not everywhere to use can make a big difference. So that's why I, I think all research efforts are totally justified. I mean, the question is, but always when a scientist starts that should be uh, end in a, in a feasible vaccine. And I just two observations. First of all, the uh, um, R21, if you really analyze it, as you have analyzed the RTSS, this is not better than RTSS. Because if you really look at the data, then it's exactly what we found in Bagamoyo with the phase two study, is the phase uh, two study of R21. So therefore a claim of Adrian Hill to make this an emergency registration with the, exactly the same data we have with RTSS, I think is not justified. I think we should remain scientists and not activists. Secondly, wow. uh, mm -hmm. is the point uh, on, on, on the CVAC. The CVAC is of course working very nicely. And I've been myself been involved with Steve, again, the bias on that whole thing. The CVAC is something which is, is, is works very well, for instance, for a traveler, short-term visit to Sanson. But if you are actually going to, uh, 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 going to use that at a community level and you have with the CVAC where you treat afterwards with, uh, with chloroquine and you, you, you miss people with the treatment, basically you infect them and they come down with malaria. That's an ethical issue that is very difficult. So in terms of public health ethics, this is very problematic. The CVAC is for selected group is something to think about. So actually these issues must be brought together. Finally, the mRNA, I think it is wonderful that, I mean, it's, I can say that here in the masterclass, the first talks we had with Moderna, if they should Moderna invest in with all the billions they make uh, in, in, in malaria and try mRNA with malaria, Moderna was very clear. We don't do that, uh, uh, and and I think uh, they they go back to oncology, and it was only the German Turkish couple Sahin who the, who actually said yes, uh, BioNTech will do that, and therefore we could liberate this money uh, to do that one. I think the mRNA is promising, but the question there is not mRNA; it's which antigens you express. So that's why I dare to say the, uh, the uh, uh, corona spike protein and the receptor binding uh, domain is very easy compared to all what we know about malaria antigens. So the big discussions we have now with BioNTech is which antigens you pack. But we, but we know that if in a liposome we pack too much mRNA, then it will also not work because many people don't know one has tried mRNA with tuberculosis, with HIV, not only in, on in oncology. And the key is that you have a simple message and not a huge cocktail of mRNAs in one liposome. This will not, this leads to a competition in the cells uh, that, uh, that you actually, that take up the liposome with the mRNA. And so this will be very exciting. But the final sentence is again, yes, because we have the proof from nature, we can solidly protect people and we should be able to really overcome that by being early. That means we are actually pro providing a vaccine. And 
uh, we, we continue with the joy to discover, with the joy to share, with the joy to translate. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Marcel. You raised a number of, uh, 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 of, of, of great technical points here. And I, I would actually love if it's possible, if you don't mind, that we focus a little bit, we, we stay a little bit on these points here. Uh, the first point you raised with regard to the, the new vaccine, the, the RTSS, but also the, um, the Adrian Hill group uh, vaccine program, that there is no difference between the R21, am I pronouncing it correctly? Is that the correct name? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that the R21 is actually not very different. Given the first two results, uh, it's not very different than the RTSS uh, first two results. Um, as you can see in the figure we have there, you, you need uh, boosters as well, and, and it works perfectly around the, the high season. And, and, and so you would potentially, if there are any challenges, face any challenges, and there's no justification for emergency registration. So that's the first point that you raised. The second point you raised with the PFS, uh, SPZ, uh, CVAC, and thanks Marcel also for bringing in the history from the, uh, the Pataroyo vaccine trials in Ifakara. We're very proud that Ifakara Health Institute was part of the first vaccine trial in Africa on the, the PFS uh, the, the 66 one. But you raised an important point here about ethics of what happens if you miss someone and do not administer the treatment. You, uh, with the doses of, uh, of the uh, sporozoites uh, being discussed at the moment, it may be a, a risk. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important point to raise. Someone might say hey, you, you have to administer the chloroquine and, and the vaccine at the same time, but it would be nice to hear your thoughts on that. And the last point you raised from the mRNA vaccine uh, issue is the issue of payload, which we, I thought was very important. You don't want to, uh, I mean, when I discussed this last time with uh, some of my colleagues, we were asking, can they multiplex um, uh, this? Can, can they have multiple antigens targeted, but you're now raising the point that you cannot pack too much in the liposome because then the payload is too big and maybe it doesn't work and so on. So any of the three points, if you like, you can choose any of them and just they, they, um, um, highlight a little bit more because I think the technical aspects of this vaccine thing are very, very important and no one explains it better than you, Masa. Back to you. No, thank you very much. I think the, the point was, I mean, uh, starting again with the SPF 66, I mean, we were all who could participate very proud and that this took place in Idete village in, in the Kilombero Valley. And I, I think this brings us a point to R21. We went particularly to an area that had high perennial transmission because there we have actually a, a, the toughest test. I think the R21 is also, is, is not only just a question if it has the same result, but it's also on which condition. And that's why also the RTSS was actually uh, uh, done in the field trials in different areas of transmission. And I think this is very interesting for people who say it's good or bad or partial only. Look at the, uh, the cases that could be prevented in the different of the 11 sites. And that, that's, uh, that is very illustrative to show you how even a partially effective vaccine can do a job. It's uh, the uh, in SPF 66 is not the case because that was uh, uh, we have done then the infant trial and the last sentence uh, says of the second publication among infants, not children, which was the first one. It says this vaccine in its current formulation is not for public health use. This actually brought us uh, a, a lot of criticism from uh, from the Colombian group because they were not part of the trial team, but they thought we would shoot them down. No, I think it still holds that actually this you cannot carry uh, to a, a community. Now, R21 is, is, is of course, a, a modification of the basically approach of, 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 of RTSS with the, uh, in terms of with, with regards to the antigens or epitopes involved. And it, it's very typical that this type of of epitopes provi provide these results throughout with other trials of, uh, of this partial effectiveness, which is then around 50, 60%. And I think that's very consistent. So there is something there which shows potential, but it's not complete because 
this leads to this question of the antigen mix in the mRNA. I think the, the, this actually means that we have to carefully select and maybe we have to have different liposomes with different epitopes with simple messages. So basically you are back in a vaccine bar, you mix your cocktail of actually, here I take 20% of liposomes with this mRNA and of this antigen and I take with CSP and I take one of the flanking region or whatever, and you actually uh, mix your cocktail, which will make trials a little bit more complex, but maybe this is the future because you cannot pack too much into one liposome. And you actually would, uh, the, vaccine pro uh, the vaccine producing cells would be then basically, uh, you would inject on one side, one uh, type and the, uh, on the other side, the other type or things like this, all this could be tested in order not to have this competition in the, in, the, in the protein production of your relevant epitopes. And uh, the ethical questions that come in, I think, uh, I mean, it, the, you cannot uh, uh, give the chloroquine uh, in, uh, at the moment of vaccination because the essence is that you want, and this has been shown with the irradiated sporozoites, they actually go into the, the, the liver cell and develop a bit. But I mean, the essence of the, of the C-vax is that you allow, as well as the genetically modified sporozoites is that they develop quite a bit and then you stop. And I think this is actually where, so that the antigen load is enough so that actually your immune response is effective. And I think this is, the thing why you cannot give it through, then you run into the public health problem that you must reach those people you vaccinate the, the, the seven days later or the six days later to administer chloroquine. Because I don't think that, uh, that I, I don't think that you should um, uh, t t allow the people to go home with the chloroquine and say, take it after six days. That is actually yeah. As, a, yeah. as, a, as a government, when you do a trial, and as a registration authority, uh, this is not allowed. But the bottom line is, let's pursue these developments and always think that already a partially effective vaccine can reduce a lot of the burden once the vaccine is part of an integrated approach and not seen as the magic bullet. Thank you very much. And therefore we're waiting a lot for the uh, final results of the pilot studies in three countries. Hopefully that comes. We want to stick uh, with this. Our time is coming up soon, but we want to stick a little bit with this topic uh, and, and look at use cases. So we'll skip the question of monoclonal antibodies, come back to it a little bit later. Uh, Shayla, back to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Fredros. Um, Marcel, thinking about the use cases for vaccines, and you have done some really good work on explaining um, or illustrating what the use cases are. Could you briefly talk to us a little bit about this, just very, very briefly, about these use cases, examples? Yes, I mean, the, the whole issue of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, review that you now display here was really uh, thinking uh, how actually do you, uh, do you really select the use of um, of, uh, of a vaccine when you have a partially effective vaccine. And I think this is, a, a, is a, an issue, which was my final sentence from before. How do you actually have the vaccine seen as part of a, of a response uh, pack, uh, package? And, uh, and here you have the points here to partly in, in, in red that actually, uh, I mean, that was even done with seasonal uh, chemo uh, uh, mass uh, chemo prevention. Uh, this was uh, compared with uh, RTSS, and uh, and uh, this, there was a trial on that one. These are exactly the cases where you try uh, to uh, to have a combination that leads to the higher protection of a specific target group. So this is also the issue of um, of um, uh, uh, using mass drug administration 
and uh, and, uh, and and comparing it with with the vaccine you that you are first for instance uh, a, a clear a clear parasite load with mass drug administration and then you would use a vaccine and and, and but that's all setting dependent i think that is what we clearly write in this paper and many others how you combine intervention i think it goes further than the vaccine and the rest it goes on how do you combine interventions to have the highest effect? And the highest effect in your fifth point here is really how do you really reach those people that are not just the most vulnerable ones, but also, also the biggest potential when we go for elimination that have um, uh, the, uh, that, that are reservoirs from where uh, transmission can start again. I mean, that would be a, a long discussion uh, uh, to to really look at combined bundles for different uh, 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 settings, and of course, again, it is dependent in which state you are. And I mean, take a high burden, high uh, high burden country. There, the things are initially easier because there you would because there you still have also a large um, child mortality and so on uh, that you would actually add to the availability, as we discussed before, of the bed nets, as well as early diagnosis and treatment, you would actually add in the MCH program, uh, the, the RTSS vaccine. This would make a big difference. And, and I think, I think uh, what we know already from this uh, pilot implementation in Ghana, uh, Malawi and Kenya, I think it is exactly what we see there. It is complementing uh, in reducing overall mor morbidity in 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 uh, in, in, in child uh, in young children, and that's why to use the pilot implementation in um, in uh, MCH clinics, even in remote ones, as an additional thing, uh, this is is, is most the, the most effective way um, uh, to use it. Thank you, Marcel. There is a question from Bana Zogo um, asking, don't you think a partial vaccine can negatively impact other, other control tools uptake? Yes, so I mean, yeah. uh, uh, just a short, uh, uh, a short yes, but uh, it depends always how you bring in a vaccine. Uh, I mean, if it's partially or very highly, the way how you bring a vaccine to people with all the local per, uh, perception that are there actually can negatively influence also other um, uh, uptake of other measures. I mean, if you start forcing people to be vaccinated, I mean, they take the extreme case and something out of the current situation with COVID. If you, if you do this, then uh, of course people get suspicious to the state that offers the vaccine and then is, is suspicious to the damage uh, that you have for other health interventions that are brought in in, 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 in a public health plan. I mean, we, we see it already now. Um, many of our societies have, um, have really uh, now, not just to, to look at long COVID, but I mean, long COVID in the system is that actually people lose, uh, for instance, trust to some of the interventions and uh, and uh, the perception vis-a-vis -vis of general measures is is, is uh, skeptical and this of course can have the effect that was asked so it's again a lot is, is setting specific and how you do it it's not only that you do it it's the how to how you reach people and you must always ask yourself how would you like to be reached in order that you are actually having trust also for other measures that you follow, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this I, is I, very I mean, often, just... we, we as scientists, we always have to ask this question, you see, right. how yeah. do we have, uh, we, how we want to be treated, how we want to be treated. And this has then actually gives us the best solution, how we can make acceptable, adequate, appropriate intervention designs. 
And I think the, the, uh, the one thing which goes very much to malaria was the, the suppositories of uh, uh, artemisinins. You know, when we had the suppositories, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, possibility if a, a unconscious or, or uh, actually a, a cerebral malaria case where all of you have tried to put an intravenous injection, be it in the subclavia or arms or feet, it's, it's very difficult. And if you just have a suppository, then actually you can actually really do a good with the fast acting artemisinins. And yeah. so people made this and you know, the first step they, they, you know, how do you do a suppository? They, they, they do it with cacao butter. But if you, in Africa, you have cacao butter and your artemisinins, uh, when the mother wants to apply it to the child, I mean, it all is in the hands of the mother because the melting point. Then the scientists say, ah, oh, no problem. We have synthetic fats. We do actually, uh, we do a synthetic fat and do the artemis. This thing is solved. No, it's not solved because we know in the African situation that we treated malaria with oral drug. Uh, and, and people are used to it. And some are still used to the chloroquine injection because this really feels it, bang, a real thing you get. And then suddenly after decades of having uh, eaten something or you just got a serious infection, even you have sometimes an abscess afterwards, uh, now you should put something anally. So this is not fitting in a, in a concept of, 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 of a population. So the whole way, uh, on the how to and yeah. the design, the scientists should already at the discovery stage think of acceptability and yeah. not only yeah. then afterwards have a social scientist who does a study on the perceptions of mother or suppositors. The scientists, the basics should already think, how do I do something acceptable, you see? Yeah, this is this is an uh, important muscle, and, and uh, uh, Professor um, Don Desavini has agreed to do a, a dedicated masterclass on health system issues. So we, we, we're looking forward to that at some point. Um, we are also looking forward to the findings of the uh, parenteral attesonate uh, uh, stuff that is uh, being used for severe malaria, and, and this parent uh, this uh, anal placements are probably have their own concerns, as you say. Uh, all, all, all very important um, issues here. Marcel, we have additional questions on these transformative technologies. We, we know that our time is limited here, but this morning, just while we were, Shell and myself were preparing for your master classes, a friend of, us, of, of a friend of ours, uh, we know through the social media system, has sent out this publication that came yesterday. It came out yesterday. This is a monoclonal antibody. Uh, results. This is the first one I've seen uh, on this uh, scale of these monoclonal antibodies. Uh, also, another potentially transformative uh, uh, technology uh, for malaria. Very briefly, can you talk to us a little bit about the potential of this approach? Um, and starting briefly with just what is a monoclonal antibody, and then you know we do that. This is from yesterday, and they have fantastic results. It appears. Yes, yes, I know this very well. I followed these developments uh, very much. And uh, I mean, uh, some actually uh, were uh, generated also in the course of the Bagamoyo um, uh, PFSPZ uh, uh, trials. Monoclonal antibodies is something that we know for a long time. Uh, and uh, by the way, it has been um, uh, Köhler and Milstein where uh, George Köhler was unfortunately dead, was in Basel and uh, at the Basel Institute of Immunology. And they got afterwards the Nobel Prize for actually generating antibodies that are produced out of one uh, basically B cell that does actually, uh, that, that, that only produces one type of antibody. And I think that is actually a, a, an issue that you can design a, a, an antibody response very specifically to uh, one epitope to which this antibody is uh, specific. And, and, uh, and, and the, the, the issue there is not that you can do that because for that, it's already 50 years, 50 years ago the, where the discovery was made. But it is if in clinical practice, be it for cancer, be it for 
uh, infectious agents, and particularly for malaria, I come back to that one. It is important, but it, you need to have a form of application. So very often uh, the antibody is easy to produce, but the stabilization of the antibody that it can be uh, intravenously applied, for instance, is, is not the easiest thing. Now for malaria, the, uh, the, the monoclonal antibody has uh, the effect for severe and complicated malaria. Uh, by, by which uh, one can particularly prevent also uh, cerebral manifestations. And therefore this remains, uh, uh, that, 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 that is uh, an intervention tool, but also, and now this is important, could also be an important preventive tool by which, and we know that from hepatitis, in former times, some of you, have received hepatitis antibodies. These were not monoclonal ones, but this was a whole yeah, soup of antibodies. And, uh, and actually, uh, this was the way that we, you do prevention with antibody. And I think this is something which we should, uh, we should really pursue. It has been uh, 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 forgotten for a time, not, but not for all. So the re-emphasis of for instance, also the Gates Foundation on it is not something, uh, uh, the re-emphasis is mainly for the Gates Foundation, but many of us actually have always believed that monoclonal antibodies can play a role. And uh, uh, these ones uh, have been selected here. Uh, these are coming from Bob Cedar's uh, group. And uh, these ones is, uh, is actually um, uh, a selection of many of a panel of antibodies which showed the, the best performance as it is written here in the conclusions. The, 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 the issue is that when you do at the place, like we do in, in Bagamoyo, uh, phase one, phase two studies, we have the unique opportunity to do with the in-depth immunology to identify the best uh, uh, antibodies that we later on could use to make monoclonal ones. And this actually, has taken place. So Bagamoyo is part of the discovery of, of, of one antibody, which is comparable to the, the one that is now in this publication. And uh, we are at the moment just looking uh, to produce a batch for trial, because the big thing and the, is that you can produce it in order to at least have enough batch uh, that carries you uh, from phase one to the proof of concept. And uh, just to give you an imp impression, this, this whole thing to, to produce a batch for the trial in this dimension, as the New England Journal publication shows, it costs about $6 million, uh, $6 million uh, uh, to produce that one. And wow. interestingly, it is also a good producers of such uh, clinical use batch is, is Lomza again, the, who, uh, who does the Moderna uh, vaccine <laughs> for COVID. Just, so I'm, I'm very much in discussion to get this going. I mean, I can say that one, that this is sort of a deal uh, said Moderna are sitting in our town here uh, in Basel. Uh, and not Moderna, Lomza. I said to Lomza, you just, I mean, you, you make now a lot of money with the COVID vaccine. Please produce us the monoclonal antibody that we have discovered in Bagamoyo. This is fantastic. That's 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 good. And it, it seems here that also there's some longevity to this, uh, uh, and and it would it would probably give you without any booster uh, up to two months of protection. So if you time it very well for seasonal uh, malaria uh, uh, settings, uh, then that's, you can get a lot of. That's the preventive one, but it it of yeah. course. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies, not exactly, but I mean, we have to work with the half-life of antibodies in our body. That is actually 28 days, yeah. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, Marcel, uh, on that. I think we had a great coverage on, on, on those two technologies. We're going to move forward. Shell, about to you. Thank you, Fred. So, Marcel, there's a lot of interest in our chats on um, gene drives. And we were discussing earlier with Fred that gene drives are actually selfish genetic elements that can be transmitted to their progeny at super Mendelian frequencies, so at very high frequencies. What is your opinion or your thoughts? What are your thoughts around um, the use of gene drives 
uh, for malaria control? Yes, it's very good, uh, Sheila, that you asked the question, what's your use in uh, thinking about malaria uh, control? I think gene drive to look at the magic thing that changes everything is dangerous. Uh, but uh, all the assessments that we have had for gene drive for specifically uh, our Anopheles population, I think this looks very favorable and one should really pursue this in order also, uh, but not as a broad blanket approach to the vector control side, but really look at each uh, case uh, very specifically because, I mean, here you have a very nice slide which shows the potential and as you just introduced it, fine. Uh, but we need now to move into a, a, a really more uh, field experimental uh, stage, but well considering uh, also the criticism that those people, particularly these organizations that are uh, and the stop the gene technology people are having. I mean, there are ethical uh, considerations that we have to answer, but I think uh, this is, and I mentioned it very briefly at the very beginning, this is for me uh, one of these transformative technologies and tools that uh, really could make a difference. And if we do not pursue this with all the caution of uh, gene manipulation that we know generally, but specifically now for malaria, then we make a mistake. It's also an ethical issue. If we know that here is something that could have a transformative, uh, actually, effect, then we must pursue that. Yeah, thank you. Fred, do you have any follow-ups? It's just really interesting to hear the persuasive arguments um, from Marcel, uh, also very balanced. Um, and it's the first time that we hear it being presented as an ethical question. We know that there's potential our decision to not go after it would be non-ethical. And, and Marcel, I would like to request that you talk a little bit more about that because usually when we hear conversations about the ethics of gene drives, it's usually from the other side. Like, is it ethical to release uh, modified mosquitoes or is it ethical to modify mm -hmm. organisms? But for the first time we hear someone say, it would be unethical for scientists not to go after a technology that could have so much potential to save lives. Uh, go for it, Marcel, and, and if you don't Yes, mind. I, I, I deliberately do that because it's always both sides. The ethical thing is not actually, you don't gene map, you don't know what it comes and so on. It is a constant, the ethical discussion is a constant risk benefit balancing which you do, I mean, you can do this on, on your individual level. And you can say as a scientist, I don't work with gene manipulation because I fear and because studies have shown and it could and so on. That's your assessment. But if you sit in a public health context now in this situation, and if you say, I mean, we, we claim that we want to have transformative technologies, we can, with our scientific knowledge, see that this potential is in gene drive, we must always do this risk benefit at the population level and not only on the individual level. And I think this is, uh, is, uh, is the same discussion of those people who say, uh, I don't want to be vaccinated. And of course, I, I accept if somebody does for an individual level uh, a, a, an assessment that says even with very little side effects uh, on high protective thing, I won't, don't want to be uh, vaccinate because my overall integrity of my body and so on. Okay, I, I accept that. I will never force that. But if we are thinking, and I think here in this audience, we think as a population of scientists and public health uh, workers who want to move towards change, better change, and uh, really that, then we must pursue in because the risk benefit assessment it is a very favorable one. And, uh, and if we do this, and that's why I say not generally, let's transform all vectors. And I, I don't know what. This actually would be dangerous, but taking the specific case here, here I, 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 we need to pursue more and go into some of the field applications, test and so on, in order to see where, where these potentials are. Otherwise, we actually fail 
to take our responsibility and some of our talk about transformative technologies is, is simple waffling around. You see. Thank you so, so much. And I think today we've discussed uh, 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 quite a number of exciting, uh, uh, potentially transformative tools. Uh, seems like a, a time to be excited. I mean, we talked about the vaccines, we talked about monoclonal antibodies, and in the vaccine space, there's the mRNA, there's the, the PFC vac, uh, there's the RTSS, and then now we have the gene drives, and we also talk about monoclonal. So it looks like uh, there is some, some great opportunity here for a uh, for uh, um, excitement and, and, and potentially making the change that we need to make. Masan, we have only 10 minutes uh, uh, to go, mm -hmm. approximately that. We have a small, uh, about uh, five remaining questions. All of them are short questions. So we're gonna rush through them uh, and, and, and then close this session. Uh, uh, we will might have one, one or two questions left, but we can always do a second masterclass if you don't mind. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I think this has been really exciting. So if you don't if you don't mind, just going to follow really 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 quickly. Uh, in it is very common in the malaria conversations that people present this graph you see on the left here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a class with Samir Bart, uh, uh, our friend who is now in Denmark previously uh, at Imperial College, uh, and this publication that demonstrates that most of the benefits against malaria. Uh, the gains against malaria since 2000 were attributable to bed nets. Uh, now, if you look at the actual numbers, the trends, you see that malaria cases have reduced quite a bit, uh, but then have stagnated. What you also see is that the, the proportion, the number of deaths has continued to go down. Uh, malaria deaths have actually uh, crushed approximately 60% uh, since 2000. And that's, that's much more impressive than that. And sometimes when you look at this, we just wonder whether we are doing a disservice to people, our colleagues working on case management or whether we are not elevating enough the potential of case management, both as you know, a prevention tool, a, a, a management tool, but also maybe it has also some benefit in prevention as well, I, I don't know. So do you think there's a way we could communicate this better to, to just say, you know what, we are seeing a lot of reduction in deaths, meaning case management is improved a lot, but we are also seeing a lot of benefit of, of bed nets and, and other vector control methods. How do we package this message to not be lopsided that we are just putting all the money on, on nets and so on? No, I think this is a very important point. I'm glad that you mentioned this question because we have the tendency also and among the scientists, but particularly in public health action, to create false dichotomies. In a way, uh, it is prevention and, uh, and, uh, and we forget the case management and, and, and. And I think this is something really, uh, uh, it's good that you mentioned it. I think we should really bring in when we have actually, and we say in the effective package why we achieved something uh, is, is really, uh, and therefore this graph there is a little bit distorted. I mean, it's the, the point that the, the, the lila part of the treatment, I mean, this is a specific action and not a blanket action. So the effect of that one, of a good case management that you early diagnose and manage the case is can never appear in the dimension of the bed net in this in this type of graph but actually the effect it has you see the effect it has is, is actually for the transmission very important of this this part because you eliminate quickly also the, the a, 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 a reservoir situation i mean this is and, and i think that's why one must uh, one must qualify a bit this um, this uh, this attribution in a, in a way you see, but of course it's true that the preventive actions here, and that's why universal health coverage, particularly when we talk about in, in we talk about um, uh, the the high burden countries, that's absolutely key. But this should not. I mean, if you have a very good high burden country preventive bed net strategy or, a, or even uh, some IRS and you, you, you cannot manage a case, uh, then of course you, you lose very quickly uh, the, the, the population 
because I mean you don't need a lot of children who are dying because yeah. uh, the uh, peripheral health unit does not function. And then actually people think and all this bazaar of IRS, I have to remove everything from my heart or I have to use the bed net. I think that uh, is the question of understanding compliance and adherence very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel. Thanks for highlighting that. Uh, we have uh, three last questions. I'm going to mention them now, and then uh, Michelle and myself will take them with you, and then we can finish on the seven minutes uh, remaining. So, Sheila, please go, go forward. Um, let me just pull up. That's okay. Slides. We can go up to 30. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring this. Bring this. Um, yes. Yeah, Marcel, um, so for the high burden to high impact, we say high burden to high impact is a country-led response. Could you talk to us a little bit about this? What does this really mean when we say country-led response? You know, the country-led response is that what we have discussed a long time, and I think it's good that you ask this again, is that this is not coming the wisdom from, uh, from Geneva and GMP. It, it, the wisdom comes out of the people who are confronted with the high burden because they best know with the available tools they have or the ones they still request on how to create high impact. And this is exactly behind this sentence is, um, is very clearly the tailoring to the local setting. High burden is not just high burden. Uh, a country with high burden on the, and the neighboring country may be totally difficult, different in the means they have, say for instance, to assure, uh, uh, to assure universal health coverage, to ensure uh, uh, early diagnosis and treatment and so on. And that's why it must be country-led, you see. That's a typical point of country-led. There is no cookbook from WHO on how to go for that one. It's only recommendation for all of us that we know we must in a coherent way uh, uh, tackle high burden countries and we must actually build on the availability of that part when you discuss with um, with Tom in the master classes about the uh, health systems this is exactly the issue the carrying capacity of the health system at the current stage of course you can strengthen it during your intervention but actually that is decisive in making country-led responses. Yeah, thank you, Marcel. Any additions, Fred? Um, no, I mean, if you look at the, the high burden, high impact uh, uh, scenario, uh, I'm just gonna project that here. This great focus on the 10 countries that carry nearly 70% of all the malaria we have thank in the you. world. And then you have India. What you also see, uh, as, as you can see in that figure, is that in recent years, nearly all these 10 countries have seen malaria increase instead of go down. So we have a situation where this group, this, 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 this celebration about the, the progress being made since 2000, but in these high burden, high impact countries, you see this uh, um, uh, malaria cases uh, uh, going up. Now, carrying that story forward, one of the things in the revised, um, slightly revised, if you like, global technical strategy is, you know, we have, we're talking a lot about the three pillars and you, you talked a little bit about surveillance responses as well, but you have these two supporting um, elements here, one of which is to strengthen the enabling environment and, and harness innovation. So the, under that, if you read that text, there is some subtext sub that I, 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 I worry that people probably don't read it because when people talk about GTS, they talk about the three pillars and that's it. So we rarely talk about these others, but you have this big issue about the private sector. And, and Marcel, from your own work, uh, uh, you have here a, a good example of Dukaladawa Muhimu in, in Tanzania, a great involvement of the private sector in elevating a potential anti-malarials 
you know, great, great potential. In Tanzania, we also have the advantage of, you know, uh, all is uh, bed, manu bed net manufacturing in Tanzania. So very good examples of how the private sector has been used and how this is supporting the GTS agenda. The question we have for you, Marcel, and I've pushed in a lot of questions into this because of time. The question we have for you is, what can we do? How, how can we get the lessons such as the ones we have from Tanzania to spread more across Africa uh, so that the private sector is much more heavily involved to support the acceleration uh, towards the high burden, high impact work, and also towards the GTS 2016, 2030 in the revised format. Back to you, Masa. Yes, I think this is a very crucial issue. And I think this has to do with the question of country led. And I think this is really in, a very important uh, that when you are actually sitting in a country, and I remember the A2Z, is actually something because we uh, have had, had a, a nucleus. You must look where are the grains that can be developed. You cannot just say you now the private sector should. You must actually, I mean, the, the bed net sector is actually best developed in the country private sector when a com company has already made fishnets because fishnet technology can be quickly adapted to a bed net technology. It's the spinning of the fibers and so on. And, and so that's how you look for nuclei, where you have, uh, have this possibility. We have this done in the DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases, already private, public private partnership, but going into country, uh, that, that is the famous uh, example of Senufa Pharma to do the uh, drug production. So you cannot go and start from scratch. That's the same thing which you cannot do uh, COVID vaccines in a, in a country that has no facilities to do that. Because until you do this is seven years until your factory is, is up and running. So it, it's really, it, 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 the private sector is exploring the nuclei. It's not to say that everywhere you must do, uh, you must do the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the bed nets and so on. But I think the, it, the issue of what you showed up now, the picture of, the, the other shops, this is something which for many commodities, I mean, here it's mainly focusing on, on, uh, on drugs, but I mean, particularly the diagnostics, for instance, would also be very good to combine. And I think here to, to find ways that the other people also uh, uh, work with RDDs. And uh, I mean, you can, uh, so that, I mean, of course, the criticism is that if I do too many RTTs, I have many people who don't have malaria, so I cannot sell what I have sold otherwise. I mean, we must find other business models on that. That's the point. So it's not only just to say we work together with the private sector, but I think it must be these business models that one has to rethink in order to really push uh, also small, like these drug shops, uh, in, 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 into the business. And I think this is the, the, the art. Where are those nuclei that you can actually uh, uh, really work on? I mean, we had issues with some of the uh, discoveries and in innovations that you generated in public health, um, uh, in public health uh, entomology. I mean, we have the same problem that we, we must find a nuclei of somebody who is, for instance, producing the well-being box and not just says, we do it with a, uh, with a 3D printer and then afterwards nothing happens. But I think it is really uh, to find these things. And that's where uh, uh, those in the malaria field, in the public health field, must look at the private sector like that one. And, that, and, and, and uh, identify where you have entrepreneurs that are interested. I mean, this is exactly what we do with the Botnar Foundation. We actually, the new, new tools and we are actually having a lot of money to invest in such uh, undertaking, particularly also in the private sector and not only in the public sector in order to, to, to make these nuclei work crystallize. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, Marcel. Uh, our second last question, I'm gonna bring this back to Sheila. Uh, uh, we'll, skip, we'll skip that. Sheila, back to you, please. Yeah, muscle. So, uh, oh, <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the question on M I'm not sure MDA. 
Oh, do, do you want me to go back to the MBA question? No, I thought you were covering the mentorship one. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so Marcel, I know that um, capacity building um, is, is really close to your heart. And given that we have really young scientists um, that join us during our masterclass, we'd just like to hear from you, like what your lessons have been during your career up to where you okay. are. What are the best lessons that you can share with us? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, it's nothing magic. You must just uh, devote time and uh, discovering all your colleagues always the potential and never the never negative things. And then actually, it's just to provide outlook. I mean, and uh, having in the aspect of mutual learning for change. I mean, I always felt that, and I have written this already when I left Tanzania for the first time, I think I have actually gained more than I actually could give. And I think this is an important point, you see? And I, yes, it is, um, it is really the, this way we are learning together uh, in order to make a step. And I think it's not one is the mentor I have many of the dear colleagues, some that are listening here. Uh, they were actually more uh, my mentors than I was their mentor because we are actually learning uh, together. And I think this attitude should um, uh, should actually be that's for me common behavior. When one wants to, when sits in the same boat, and we are working across systems and cultures. This learning from each other makes us uh, thrive. If we are sitting only in one boat, in our single Mtumbi, I always use the example of Mtumbi. Everybody has the dog out, his or her own, and then they are actually only crying when they get a problem with the crocodile when they are in, 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 their, in their dog out. But instead of being all in one boat, then actually we are always together. We don't have to have the same opinion but we go into the same direction. And this is a little bit mentorship. Mentorship is for me something which is just natural on how you respect uh, a colleague, uh, irrespective of age and positions, you know. With this position thing, I always say, uh, you know, when I have to write in forms, position in your profession, I always write in sitting, and then people get nervous because then I say, no, it's sitting because we are all sitting around the table, you see. <laughs> it's not one is director and so the position I have is sitting or walking. <laughs> and, and this is so, just a natural thing. One has to take these things uh, just in a way how you respect uh, uh, your, your colleagues and you, you want to learn together and then we move. Uh, there's nothing matching for me. But I think this, the here you have the questions, you see, we should understand the iterative cycle between the field and the lab and the desk, maybe, or the screen. I mean, here, I mean, too many people have not enough dirt on their boots. That's the problem. Dirt on the boot means you have <coughs> not only had to do your nice study, but you really had also to work with people to get something going. And I think this is very classical in COVID. You have so many epidemiologists who do models, but they don't, have never seen a sick person. I mean, we have also mal malaria modelers who have never seen a patient, never seen a patient dying. And uh, after they don't have enough dirt on their boots, they don't know how the reality is. And, and good mentoring has to do with, uh, with, uh, with also that one brings the experience from lab field desk uh, uh, together. And it's clear that, as you say, it's a long-term investment and so on, you know. Thank you so, so much, Marcel. Uh, I have to say, uh, Sheila and myself enjoyed preparing for the class. Uh, we enjoyed reading uh, uh, this paper you wrote with Lucas, my uh, fantastic uh, uh, reflections. There is a, another paper that you also wrote on this uh, transdisciplinarity, actually, which we also have uh, uh, here. Both of them were very, very uh, insightful. 
on the, this situation you've just described. Marcel, we've come to the end of the masterclass today. We just would like to ask you if you have any final comments for Sheila and myself and also for uh, the rest of our colleagues joining in the call today. Uh, you have, uh, it's up to you to have the final words and then my colleague Sheila will close uh, the masterclass today. But really for my, my heart and for my colleagues, really just to say a big, big, big thank you for all the effort you've made today. Uh, back to you, Master, for your last comments. No, uh, I mean, first of all, I have to thank you all that I mean, I could be part again of this same boat that we are in. And I'm, I was happy. I don't have any further questions, but I hope that this, I find this initiative of this masterclass is very good. I find the format very good and there are still remaining questions and people are actually in, encouraged to write. I cannot write whole papers back as answers. I mean, you must understand, I have at the present, I still receive three to 400 emails per day. But anyhow, as I saw in the chat, some people want my, uh, my, my email uh, address. I mean, this is very easy to find everywhere. I think it's marcel.tanner at unibus.ch. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can really get back and we will also meet. And we will discuss further in this spirit that we exchanged, you see. Nothing matching, just we must respect what everybody does, that we have the same ideas, that we uh, pull on the same string, and we uh, and it's a joy to exchange. It, uh, like this, we are be creative, you see. And I think this is only what I have to say, and it's a big thank you. And of course, it's, uh, I would rather like to be in Tanzania now than here, but I mean, that's another problem. I miss you all. And I miss uh, not only those in Tanzania, I also miss uh, Don sitting in Canada or Maxine sitting in uh, Shelley Beach or, or, or in uh, Townsville. But I, 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 really, uh, I really miss you all and these interactions. And I thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much for uh, Sheila Bhakti. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Marcel Tana. I think um, this, this was an interesting masterclass. Um, thank you for all the technical um, knowledge that you shared with us today. Um, thank you for explaining uh, all the technicalities with regards to the differences between the vaccine candidates that we have in place or the potential candidates. Um, thank you also for sharing um, really lastly the issue or, or the advice on mentorship or how to move on, um, to move ahead in one's career. So we thank you for your time and for sharing openly. Um, and we hope to host you again soon um, on a different topic maybe we'll discuss with Fred. And to all our participants, thank you so much for joining us today and for um, uh, uh, a very vibrant chat um, and all the questions that you are, that you asked. If there are any questions that weren't answered, we will ensure that uh, Professor Marcel Turner responds to those privately and we will send you um, any responses afterwards. So we thank you all for joining us today and have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Bye bye. Kwaherini. Thank you. Asante Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. Thanks, everybody.